There are all kinds of Easter eggy things in Cracking the Code. You may have noticed in episode four when the purple notebook flies by. There's some tablature in there. By Crossroads Breakdown. What's that? Well, in episode five, we find out. Now, what was so scary about this is how unvarnished and in your face the playing is in this lick. He goes from dead silence to total speed picking intimidation. in zero seconds flat. He even takes off his jacket to do it, like you know what's coming. The whole guitar duel is over even before it starts. The first phrase of the run contains a legato figure and I have it notated like this. This comes from this pentatonic fingering. Which is one position higher than the standard box position pentatonic. It's a very common pentatonic fingering, except most guitar players don't utilize it in its entirety. A very common thing to do is to begin a phrase up here. and then slide down to the standard box position to complete the phrase. In this sense, I often think of this position not so much as a complete pentatonic position, but as merely an upper string extension to the standard box position pentatonic. So one possibility is that Steve is using the extension to play this first phrase of the lick. Another possibility is that Steve is actually using the standard box position, but with a slightly wider stretch. And there's good reason to consider the standard box position for this beginning phrase. This lick is a mainstay of Steve's pentatonic soloing, and you can hear it in songs like Elephant Gun, Stand Up, and many of Steve's live solos. It's built on this wider box position stretch. So we know that this fingering exists and is common in Steve's playing. So if we're gonna go a different way with this lick, we need some good evidence to do it. And when I was first transcribing this, I was pretty much stuck and I couldn't make up my mind until I realized that the evidence that I was looking for was right under my nose. That, of course, is another section of Jack Butler's solo, a part which I like to call the evil solo. And it contains this lick. This is a variation on the elephant gun lick that's played one position higher in the extension. Like the elephant gun lick, it contains this combination of picking and legato, which is exactly the same combination of picking and legato that we hear in the opening statement of the intimidation run. And therefore, ergo, I conclude that the intimidation lick is played right here. The second half of the opening statement switches from pentatonic to diatonic, and I'm pretty certain it's played here. 
And we have two good pieces of evidence for this. One is the repetition of these two notes. Anytime you hear something like this, which is slightly out of character with the rest of a passage, it should raise a flag that perhaps something unusual is going on here. Now, outside of purely aesthetic choice, what else could be causing the repetition of these two notes? Well, how about this? Position shifting. If we connect this three note per string scale fingering with the next lower three note per string scale fingering, exactly at the moment that the shift happens, we get a back-to-back -back repetition of these two notes, except with different fingers. And if we listen very closely to the solo, lo and behold, this is what we hear. That is the tiniest bit of a slide. Now, it would be very unusual for this type of artifact to occur if you were simply playing these two notes with the same two fingers. But it would be very likely for this artifact to occur if, in fact, the pinky caused it on its way down to the next lower position. In fact, it's not even so much a slide as a misfretted note in the left hand. I did the same exact thing by accident. And this is an interesting comment on the transcriber's art. Good transcription is always a combination of what you are hearing with what you know about a player's stylistic tendencies. We talked about this in episode four in the archaeology scene, where we talked about listening to different types of articulations, picked notes, legato notes, open strings, as a type of archeological evidence during transcription. When you combine this evidence with your knowledge of a particular player's style, in other words, what would be common or not common for a particular player to do, it can be a very powerful indicator as to where on the neck a particular thing is being played. In this case, the repeated notes and the sliding artifact are good indicators that we have the fingering correct here. But it turns out there's a third piece of evidence, the position shift itself. And this becomes clear when we see what happens next. What's going on here is you have seven notes, which form a complete round trip through one three note per string scale fingering. The pattern starts on the highest note and ends on the lowest. So it's actually a descending figure. And Steve usually connects this to the next lower position. And because the connections between the positions are stepwise, you're never moving more than one scale degree. When you connect these all together, can't hear the shifts, it's just a swirl of notes that oscillates lower and lower. This pattern of sevens is a Vi trademark. You can hear it in Big Trouble. Tobacco Road. Anytime he's doing fast, alternate picked, descending scale runs. In fact, the rationale for the pattern is closely linked to Steve's picking technique. And we're gonna talk more about this in season two of Cracking the Code when we start to take apart Steve's alternate picking mechanics. So now we're one position lower, but we're about to get even lower than that. And that's because Steve uses the sevens pattern not just as a way to get to a lower position, but almost always as a setup for a change to the next lower string. And this, in turn, sets us up for the next phrase of the lick. This is a complete round trip across two strings of the same three note per string scale fingering. It's like going up the hill. and then back down the hill. At the bottom of the hill, we start on a downstroke. 
And that means the top of the hill starts on an upstroke. And it has to be this way. This is pure alternate picking and the sevens pattern left us here on a downstroke, so that's how we have to start. And that's fine because two string circular patterns like this are extremely common. And starting them on a downstroke, which we would call outside picking, is also an extremely common way to structure them. But now I'm gonna do something unusual and throw in one pull off at the bottom of the hill. This causes the hill pattern to end on an upstroke. And that means the picking on the next string will start on a downstroke. And this has to be the case. Why? Sevens. The final string of the lick starts with yet another sevens pattern. Rolls right into another descending position shift. It's classic Steve Vai. These sequences always start on a downstroke. And there's no reason to think it's happening any differently here. But there's yet another piece of evidence for this downstroke business, and it's this. Harmonics. As if the display of power and precision in this little solo break weren't enough, Steve caps the passage in total finesse by playing the final two notes with a slide and harmonics. Now, right-hand harmonics almost always occur on downstrokes. And if you work backwards through alternate picking, that means we have to start this string on a downstroke. in order to get that first harmonic note, the one with the slide, to also be a downstroke. Then the final note that occurs after that can also be a downstroke because we're slower at that point. So the final two notes of the lick are both downstrokes. And again, it has to be that way because they're both harmonics. And this is another great archeological indicator that you can use during transcription. Harmonics equals downstroke. Not only that, but since harmonic nodes only occur in specific places along the string, this tells you exactly where the player's hand was when they hit that note. In this case, we know that the pick needs to be exactly here to trigger the first harmonic on the slide. Now, when we change the left hand position down to the final note, which is C, but maintain the pick position, we get a totally different harmonic. This time, we get the note G. But that note C is not replaced by the note G. It's rather a blend of C and G so you can hear the fundamental and the harmonic at the same time. And you control this by how much finger touches the side of the string. So again, total finesse, total precision. Total intimidation. And that's what I always thought was so funny about this breakdown. Steve plays it at pretty much the beginning of the duel. And it's so good that if Ralph had to answer it, the whole movie would be over. So instead, to keep the scene going, everybody makes believe like they didn't hear it. And then we get the actual duel where Steve plays rock, and of course rock beats blues. So then Ralph plays classical because classical beats rock. Now at the time, kids understood this mathematics. Neoclassical was the hot new thing, so of course if you could play that, you were the best. But in the movie, he drops out of school to play blues, and it's a movie about blues, so why does he have to play classical to win? It doesn't make any sense. But you know what? Steve played the rock and the classical parts anyway. 
So the only message that I took from this is that in the rock, paper, scissors, or the rock, blues, classical of guitar playing, no matter which way you flip that coin, it's always Steve that wins. (laughs) 